please join me in a massive round of applause to welcome Ben Miller. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Rob. Thank you all so much for coming. I uh, really appreciate that spontaneous welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, ben, you've written a book. I have. It's very good. I finished it last night. Uh, it's about the search for extraterrestrial life. Yes. What that might look like. Yes. And how we might go about finding it. Exactly. Why did you start? Um, why did you write the book? I think it was a bit of a midlife crisis thing, really. I mean, I just got very interested. I, st um, s my scientific training was in physics. Um, I just always loved science. It's not something I've done as a career. It's always been a hobby. It's just something I just really get a lot of enjoyment from and a lot of pleasure from. And this book sort of started with a previous book. I wrote a book called It's Not Rocket Science, which is basically, I felt there weren't any books out there which uh, described the best bits of science for people without, for bright people without a scientific uh, training or background. So I thought, well, can it, you know, it, would it be possible to write about all the bits of science that I love and explain it in a way that, um, say, a creative person with a really good arts degree could maybe pick up and, and really get access to science. Yeah, really, di and this is digging deep into that particular topic of astrobiology and... So yeah, astrology. so when I was doing that book, um, mo I came across, you know, uh, partly I wanted to do some stuff about uh, DNA and um, mm -hmm. the latest advances in sort of biology, and that just got me really interested in life, you know, the physics of life, what is life, came across a brilliant book by Erwin Schrodinger called What is Life, which talked about, um, <coughs> really about how does life fit in with the second law of thermodynamics, you know. I thought it was one of the topics I hadn't covered in the first book was entropy and the second law of <coughs> thermodynamics. I thought, wow, is that something that I could try and, you know, is that something I could try and do justice to? Also, I just think aliens is a funny topic. It's something naturally amusing about it, um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. And at the beginning of the book, you know, I, one of the, whereas the first book, I was really in my comfort zone. I was writing about things that I sort of knew quite well. This book, I didn't know any of this stuff when I started out. So uh, it was also kind of like, for me, it was like my, my dream yeah. sort of adult education course, really. So I went to meet all these amazing people, incredible people, and you know, uh, to begin with, I had this real embarrassment, you know, a real embarrassment about asking them about, one of the first people I went to meet was um, the uh, head of ANUSA, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. She's our ambassador if aliens That's down, right. So the idea, <laughs> yeah, and this, is a, uh, this, is, this was a sort of where, the, where, where part of the idea for the book came from. The, the idea is that if aliens were to land, the UN needs to have a response. The, I mean, this is literally like if they landed in a, s in a spaceship <laughs> and you know, came out and held a press conference, <laughs> um, there would have to be somebody, uh, there's somebody whose job it is at the UN <laughs> to liaise with the aliens. That's not her only job. That's not her only no. job. <laughs> um, you know, uh, <laughs> she's also got to find ghosts. Uh, no, she's also no, it's not her only job. It also tracks that you know that office. Uh, they basically keep track of all the satellites. And, uh, basically, if you want to put a satellite up, you have to talk to Anusa first. And uh, yeah, so I went to meet her, and I felt so. And the story is in the book. I felt so embarrassed. You know, that I was going to some. You know, there's a very eminent uh, Malaysian uh, physicist <laughs> who'd set up the Malaysian. Uh, space program and had launched the first Malaysian satellite and was now the head of ANUSA and I kind of went to have this thing and I said so um, can we just talk about this this aliens thing and you know, I said is it true that you know if aliens <coughs> land then you're the designated uh, spokesman on behalf of the human race and she said um, yeah it's pretty cool isn't it <laughs> 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 um, and I just had the most brilliant uh, chat with her where we got on quickly, you start talking, you know, you start talking about <coughs> life, you start talking about, um, you very quickly get on to uh, what makes life so special. Um, you quickly, we very quickly got on to even spiritual subjects, you know, what does, you know, what, 
what, do, what does it all mean? You know, what are we, what are we here for? And um, why do we want to talk to aliens? And, 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 and I began to realize that there was a real science, there was real science that you could go, <coughs> what you could do is you could take the l all the latest um, stuff that we found in astronomy and you could take all the latest stuff that we'd found in evolutionary biology and you could put it all together and you could do a pretty good job really of finding out what life on earth could tell you about uh, any other life that might be out there and that's in every respect you know how it uh, how it might get it, its start um, what life is uh, in physical terms you know is, is there any and uh, you know this is a, it's, a it's a huge subject how would you how would you communicate with it if you could communicate just say for example you know we did manage to receive some kind of signal how would we know it was a signal how would we uh, could we decode it you know if we couldn't, couldn't decode it what could we what information could we get from it it's a kind of mm. and it becomes a really I mean it's I think on, on that topic I, there was a point where you um, we can talk about Zip's law and dolphins and kind of move on to that oh. that which is brilliant so oh my god but essentially you don't even if you can't <laughs> understand what is in a signal you could prove that it had <coughs> intelligence behind it well yes I imagine that sort of information theory will be bread and butter to a lot of people here but it was it was very new to me and the idea that um, you could Basically, the mathematical properties of language are, are there whether or not you can understand what the message says or not. So you can know that something, you can't know that it's got, you can't know that it is language, that yeah. it is communication, but you can, you can see whether it has the, the properties of language and you can see how complex a language it could possibly be um, without knowing the context, you analyze the, the speech patterns of a child, they're less complicated than the speech patterns of an adult. Exactly. Child. So they did this brilliant thing. So one of the one of the the stories in the book is is about how and this was really news to me. I hadn't realized that we kind of think of ourselves as very special, you know, Homo sapiens. We think of ourselves as being really extraordinary as you know, we are intelligent, we you know, it began with the um, you know, domestication of animals and, uh, you know, and farming, and then we built civilizations, and then we discovered language, and, you know, we have this story that we tell ourselves where we, have, we are completely unique on the planet, and it's really, really interesting to discover that all those traits are there in other species. You talk about farming as something ants do. Ants, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's, a, um, <laughs> there's a South American ant that's been farming, uh, fungus farming, for s about six yeah. million <laughs> years. And they, they treat the um, fungus with antibiotics. They treat they the fungus they with antibiotics, they farm it, they cultivate it, they use it as food. They do, it's farming. I mean, you can't, you can't argue with it. It's, it's definitely farming. Um, there, there are, there are core, you know, the crow family. I met this fabulous professor at the University of Cambridge who's done a lot of work with crows and has shown that crows have cognitive abilities <laughs> not just on a par with chimpanzees but in some cases better better than, yeah. than than chimpanzees and you start to form this picture of it's it, it's just very it starts to become very very interesting and you see uh, our own privilege very lucky position as being more of an accident really than a kind of uh, a vital last step in a long chain of progressive evolution. Yeah. It's really interesting. And you seem to, you call out the intelligence. So um, the example of convergence, where different <coughs> elements come about through entirely different evolutionary paths. That's a great example. And intelligence yeah. being one of those. Exactly. So this, uh, again, new to me, was this idea of convergent evolution. We've all heard of divergent evolution, the way that, you know, organisms speciate over time and we end up with a, you know, a planet that's full of all kinds of different things. But there are also, there's also convergent evolution. So um, things like wings have evolved independently maybe half a dozen times in different species, completely unrelated. Uh, in fact, convergence is such a problem for biologists that many mistakes mm. have been made, you know, since the uh, 19th century where 
Or uh, uh, one, one uh, creature from one part of the planet looks so like a creature from another part of the planet, they believe they're related and only later find out that they are on a completely different evolutionary path. I was reading this morning that carni carnivorous plants have evolved nine times in five different orders. Yeah, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is everywhere. Yeah. So teeth, eyes, we ha our eyes are remarkably similar in design to octopus eyes, for example. But obviously, the common ancestor of us and the octopus is, you know, you're going right back to, um, you know, the Cambrian, the Cambrian explosion, you know, 540 million years ago. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really striking. And intelligence, uh, you know, th there is intelligence in, you know, arguably intelligence in dolphins and crows in o octopus in, <coughs> you know, I mean, you could include dogs, cats, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of different creatures. Of the two, of all of those, the most interesting is probably octopuses and mammals, because there's, again, it's such so a long, long way. such a long way back. But even with crows, I mean, you, for a common ancestor between crows and us, you've got to go back to, uh, you know, an, what they call an amniote, you know, something that was laying, that was basically just laying eggs, yeah. eggs well on Well, let's land. go right back to the beginning again. So you yeah. open the book with extremophiles. So bacteria yes, and yeah, a yeah. rock here. How do I see the other? Th There's been three. What was happening is uh, all three different areas of science are all sort of converging on the same point. You know, really, we've had the Kepler Space Telescope, which has shown us that Earth-like planets are common. You know, so whereas 20 years ago we might have believed there were no other planets outside the solar system, we now know Earth-like planets are common. And uh, you, you know, maybe something like one in a thousand solar systems is like our own with a big cold Jupiter, um, terrestrial planets uh, at the right distance from a sun-like star to have water on, uh, on their surface. We know that these things are, are common. So that's, that was one area. There's another area which was extremophiles, which we've also, has also been going in parallel, where we've discovered that life on Earth is much more uh, resilient, uh, creative, resourceful than we ever realized, you know, we thought that there was a certain zone of temperatures, acidities, um, pressures, where uh, radiation levels where life could exist. And time and time again, we've discovered that's wrong. You always find a, some bacterium somewhere very, very happy to live in those conditions. Um, and then finally, there's been the advances. Again, this is all new to me. And it's really, really great stuff. Advances in evolutionary biology. So we've now got some really good theories that make an awful lot of sense. Um, not the kind of the da you know the Darwin warm pond that you may have sort of heard of, but this idea that life began in alkaline hydrothermal vents, because you get a particularly unique si situation there where you've got lots of transition metals. One thing we do know is that life as we know it adores transition metals, kind of uses transition metals as little batteries to um, borrow electrons from and and pay electrons back w when it suits it, uh, you have this great sort of, it's an electrochemical cell basically, because the early sea, wa uh, the first sea waters were uh, acidic, and if you have an alkaline hydrothermal vent, yep. you essentially get a across the membrane, the sort of semi-permeable membrane of uh, the bubbles inside the vent, um, you sort of gel-like uh, iron sulfide bubbles, you get this uh, charge separation, and that can be used to drive um, as an energy source to drive the uh, formation of long chain molecules. So suddenly, uh, or so many missing steps of the jigsaw are are almost are almost falling into place. And if uh, and and you begin to have an explanation for the beginning of life that sort of makes sense in you know physical, biological, and chemical terms. You know. Uh, so, so once you have that... You've got these three yeah, areas all life. coming together, and now everyone's going, shit, there's life everywhere. Yeah. Because, you know, we, you know, we think uh, volca you know, volcanic Earth-like planets would be common. Um, uh, we know that life on Earth started pretty much out of the box. Uh, the early Earth, as you know, was pummeled with asteroids. We're <coughs> now pretty sure that life started even during that period. Um, so that means that it couldn't really have been in a pond. A pond doesn't make sense if the Earth's getting pummeled with asteroids, but a, uh, a hydrothermal vent on the 
you know, on the ocean floor, that makes complete sense. Um, and we know that these planets are common, and we know that life can exist in such an extraordinary wide variety of uh, conditions. In fact, we're the extremophiles. You know, uh, this is the thing that we've basically sort of figured out, is that um, microbial life um, s didn't, you know, the first microbial life basically used uh, metals as a food as a food source. It just ripped to let the, uh, now life, you know, the life that produces the food, the sugars that we like to eat, rips electrons off water, uh, stuffs them onto carbon dioxide to make long chain molecules. Well, the first life ripped, uh, ripped electrons just from metals that were, that were in the vent. Again, stuffed them onto carbon dioxide to make long chain molecules. So once you have that early microbial yeah. life, which let's assume that it's quite abundant throughout the universe, yeah, this is the difficult. Well, that, but well yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the tricky bit, isn't it? Because how do you get to complex <coughs> life? So, yeah, my, microbial life common. Most reasonable people, I think, you know, <laughs> certainly once you've read, I'm pretty convinced. This book, yeah. <laughs> uh, you would believe, is is uh, as I say, sort of works straight out of the box. The trick is to get to complex multicellular life. Now, multicellularity, uh, cells just getting together to make life easier than themselves. That's that has again emerged many, many times throughout the history of life on Earth. And you get multicellularity, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, it's pretty, we've done a billion, billion and a half years of, of life, uh, the first sign of life on Earth. Complex multicellularity, where you get organisms with tissues, uh, and animals would be the best example of that. That has, has emerged, you know, maybe a handful of times. There's, there's, you know, there's... But still more than once. Three types of algae. There's basically fungi, and then there's us. So, <laughs> um, you know, out of five times, only once has any, uh, only one of those branches has produced intelligent life. And the problem with, with all of those um, branches is they, if you follow them back, if you follow the family tree back, you get to one single event. And this is the really worrying thing. You follow all of um, you follow all complex multicellular mm. life back, you get to one event, which was the creation of one eukaryotic cell. So basically, in the most brief terms, there were two types of um, single-celled life on the Earth, the bacteria and the archaea. And then again, around, it's something like a, a billion and a half years ago, there was this one single event where a bacteria attempted, or an archaea attempted to consume a bacteria, and the two set up a kind of hostage situation. And the bacteria then evolved into what we call the mitochondria, and that's the that's where we get the energy supply to fund um, the huge information overhead of complex intelligent life. Is this is the beautiful th thread that runs through all of this is energy and, and information. So we need that constant source of energy in the vent the, uh, to, to power the creation of the very first proto-life. Um, and, and then we need, and the great innovation of the, what they call, what biologists call the eukaryotes, creatures like ourselves, which are made up of not these simple cells, but these complex, incredibly complex eukaryotic cells. Um, the, the great innovation there is we have basically enslaved bacteria into our, you know, within each of ourselves, there's, you know, there's, there's all these mini power plants producing this enormous amount of energy so that we can store all that information in the cell nucleus and we can and we can suddenly start to have really, really complex life. And that only, uh, as far as we know, that only happened once. And that's the bottleneck, really. That's, that's the bottleneck that we've got to get through. Microbial life quite common. Microbial that's the life common. But, and then once you get past that. Shocking bottleneck. Um, now, there is, <laughs> there is one element of hope, which is, did happen arguably one other time, which is in plants. So what happened was the archaea enslaved the bacteria in the state of the bacterium, created the eukaryotic cell, and basically created mitochondria, this thing that provoked the powerhouse of eukaryotic cells. Then another amazing thing happened. There was another 
type of um, another great innovation, arguably in evolution, is um, photosynthesis. Is unlike in the vent where f metals were the food, it's taking light energy and using that to power the stripping of electrons from water and pushing that. So it's only light, which is an incredibly <laughs> good supply, water, which is an incredibly good supply, both used to produce long chain carbon molecules. That's a hugely important innovation. And that happened when a eukaryotic cell enslaved what's uh, called a cyanobacteria. Is you know basically it was a type of bacterium that had evolved uh, chlorophyll, and that's what created plants. So there's a chink of hope there. In that that's the same process basically. That's one uh, that's one cell enslaving another cell to do its dirty business. You know so so we enslaved the um, uh, you know, we enslaved the mitochondria. We also ensla enslaved the plasmids that are in plants. So it's kind of somehow. So you could maybe argue, well, well, it happened twice in the history of life on Earth. But you can't get away from the fact that the plant thing happened after the eukaryotic. So you've still got the bottleneck back there. You know, you've still got the eukaryotic yeah. bottleneck. And that's the thing that keeps me awake at night, frankly, I think. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I just think, you know, this is this isn't great, is it? We've only got one example of life to work on, but but there's still a lot of there's still a lot of information there in the sort of history of life on Earth. But we're kind of thinking, I just it just ends up with me thinking that intelligent life, not common, not not non-existent, yeah, yeah. But not not common. So if we assume that intelligent life is out there, this skips the other end of the book. Yeah, you talk great. about messaging. Yeah, so messaging, if yeah, we yeah. were to receive a message, what that might look like, and you use the example of hieroglyphs as something that we, we kind of had a message, we saw the information there, but oh, we couldn't understand how to read This is a fantastic story. This is a fabulous story, uh, particularly, I imagine, if, you're, if your brain enjoys coding and decoding. I mean, this is just a great story. So it's the closest thing. I, I, I was trying to think, what is the closest we've, that we've ever got as a species to d decoding the messages of another species? And the best example I could think of was, um, are, you know, in the 19th century, when they were attempting to, when Egypt was suddenly opened up again to the Western world through, um, you know, uh, Napoleon's attempt to colonize it. And suddenly we had this flood of, I mean, there had been a few Egyptian monuments, obviously in Rome, that the Romans had collected and brought back to Rome, but, but really they were mainly... Uh, they were mainly what they call cartouches, basically the throne names of the kings. They, those, those happened to be the monuments they had. They didn't have a great deal of text. And when um, uh, Napoleon attempted to colonize Egypt, um, the, he took with him like a shipload of the French intelligentsia. Um, this is just such a brilliant story. They're called the savants. Um, and among them were um, Fourier, you know, the French mathematician. Um, I mean, there was some, there was some extraordinary mm. French biologists. They collected uh, Fourier, as in trans. Yeah, as okay. in transforms. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, they collected an enormous amount of text. Suddenly, they discovered, wow, it's not just it's not just these throne names on the monument. There is a language here, and they just couldn't crack it. I mean, it took. I mean, it's an extraordinary story of how they, they eventually managed to, uh, a French character, Champollion, who f finally managed to crack the hieroglyphs. Um, it was also, you know, Young Slits. Have you heard, remember Young, the, um, the yes, Thomas, the Thomas, 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 Thomas Young, Young, the, uh, Brit the um, British, uh, um, well, among many things, physicist. He, uh, he kind of got part the way there because he managed to guess, he had a, he had a, actually, ironically, it was the throne names that enabled them to crack did, the code. Did they have the Rosetta Stone at this point? Yeah, well, the Rosetta Stone was the discovery of the, yes, absolutely. So maybe explain what that is in case people don't know. So they found the, so this is a, a basically, it's all over the, for the French in Egypt. They're kind of on their way out. They decide to, they're trying to, um, they're trying to build a fort at what used to be called uh, Rosetta on the Nile. And uh, one of the soldiers discovers, it's basically just part of the wall. It's just one of the bricks. They're taking this down this ancient wall to rebuild it. It's a, it's a stone. And then there are three inscriptions on the stone. Um, one is, uh, one they recognize straight away as the Egyptian yeah. hieroglyphs. 
Another, and there are two the other types of Greek. Yeah, yeah, there's Coptic, and then there's um, another type of Greek. I believe it was Demotic. Okay. So they've got two, one kind of Greek that they recognize, another kind of Greek they don't recognize, and the hieroglyphs, and and the, and one of them, uh, and one of the savants made the you made the guess that this could be the same bit of text written in these three languages. It's, it's really boring text, isn't it? It's so dull. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's really dull. It's basically, it, it, it's a kind of a sort of eulogy. To, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, it's, it's saying how they should honour uh, one, um, one of the kings of yeah. Egypt. And it's, it's really, really dull. I mean, it's really, really <laughs> extraordinarily detailed. You know, you m this offering must be, be made on this day. And it's, it's kind of like, um, it's sort of like bureaucracy, really, in the extreme. And, but this <coughs> text was, of course, what enabled them to crack the hieroglyphs. And that's exactly what we don't have when we receive our alien message. You know, we don't how we, as th we have no idea of knowing what is in the message. We can make guesses, you know, we can hope that, that mathematics is universal and they might send us prime numbers to start off with and maybe they'll send us a few, um, you know, fundamental constants of nature, things that are independent of whatever measuring system you use, you know, things like the ratio of, you know, the charge on an electron or pi. to... Or pi, or, you know, we can hope what the, the, that they're... Um, <laughs> we can hope that we know what's in the message of those things, but if we couldn't crack the ancient... You know, if we find it so hard to crack the messages of the ancient Egyptians, it's really hard to see um, what hope there would be, apart from through information theories. This is the wonderful thing, coming back to yeah. the front. This guy, Zip, um, spotted... Um, you may, uh, th this was news, news, news to me, it might not be news to um, uh, many people here, but this uh, brilliant sort of uh, discovery by this, this um, American, George Kingsley Zipf. So he noticed that if there's anything that involves humans, you see a certain kind of pattern. Um, so say, for example, if you look at and uh, things obey a sort of logarithmic scale. So, so say, for example, the richest man in Britain will be 10 times richer than the 10th richest man, who will be 100 times richer than the 100th richest man. And it's, you see this pattern not only in throughout the whole of human civilization, but you also see it in human language as well. So if you take any text, I mean, absolutely any text, and you start plotting the frequency of occurrence of words against their rank, you get uh, a straight logarithmic plot. So in other words, there are features of uh, human interaction, human language, that are independent of the messaging system that you It works use. in all languages. Well, and in all it languages. seems to be inbuilt to nature. Inbuilt to nature. And they did it with dolphins, and they also found that dolphin whistles obey this yeah. uh, zip plot. Not baby dolphins, because they babble. Not <laughs> adolescent dolphins, because they just slag off their parents the whole time. <laughs> but adult dolphins, you get this beautiful straight yeah. uh, zip plot. If you plot their most frequently used whistles against the rank of that, freq uh, rank of that frequency, it's absolutely amazing. And this comes back to the work of Claude Shannon and uh, the fantastic um, the fantastic work he did in information theory in showing that the potential information content of a message, you, you can figure out what the potential information content is without knowing what the message is. And this is, this is our best hope, basically, uh, when we receive um, alien messages. So what does it mean? It means when we're messaging to aliens, you guys are going to be really important. We have to send the whole internet. <laughs> we send the whole thing. Um, photos included, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and uh, for several reasons. I think we have to be. On I think it's important in this exercise that we're honest about who we are, that we think about um, our responsibilities as as a species, uh, that we take our global organisations seriously, that we um, uh, that we consider what we have to say to other alien intelligent alien species out there what we have to what we have to offer what we're hoping to receive and we just send them everything because 
the chances of them being able to decode it are minimal unless they have a vast, yeah. vast amount of data, and vice versa. You know, we are hoping we don't want to just get a picture of a stick man. You know, with the stuff that we've been sending or out. Voyager you know, one, it's just yeah, a stick Voyager man. Yeah, Voyager one, a stick man, a naked woman, and a, you know, a, a walking stick or whatever. We just send, <laughs> we just send a lot. We just send the internet, the whole thing. Let's see if there's any questions. Yeah. So the book covers quite a wide range. Yeah. So all the things that, um, that keep you up at night uh, make me sleep more soundly. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, the, um, uh, you know, we, if we, uh, if humanity survives, we'll eventually, you know, fill the galaxy. Our descendants, or you know, the nearest equivalents, will fill the galaxy and the, the galaxies nearby. Yeah. And no alien species has done that yet, so we're not seeing them. Something is between them and doing that, and either that something is behind us or it's ahead of us. Yeah. Uh, if the the problem is that my complex, my uh, multicellular life, uh, eukaryotic cells and stuff, are very very rare in the in the um, galaxy. Um, that means it's behind us. That means that's, that we can be you know, rest easy that we're going to make it to the rest of the um, galaxy. If it's ahead of us, we should be very pessimistic. And I, you know, I worry about that. So I, every time I hear something that says, you know, this is why alien life is rare, it's because of some filter that we've gone through, then I feel better. <laughs> yeah, me too. And of course, there's another, there's another possibility, isn't there, which is it's there, but it's simply not visible to us because we just simply aren't looking for the right thing I mean and if we think how transient our technologies are you know I mean we sent our first signals with uh, you know we sent our first narrowband signals were were radio waves that were just blasted out everywhere into space um, we then we then st we then went almost radio silent as we started to um, you know our own communications became you know via satellites and cable you know then we're now starting to use, like, laser communication is probably a much more energy efficient and reliable way to um, set up, you know, some kind of interstellar network. So that's probably the way we're going next. How long will that last? Maybe that lasts, for, you know, 10, 20 years before we're, I don't know, we're, we're modulating neutron beams or something. You know, I mean, who knows? I think it, it's... I, I, that's the, 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 I take some comfort from, from that, you know, as I kind of think, well, we're part, we, we are passing, our technology, our, our, so transient, these technologies, and, and what we use, I mean, we're, we're already, you know, the classical information that we've got on the internet, you know, where there's, there's, there's going to be a new phase where we, you know, we surely we'll move into some other kind of more quantum-based, we'll move into some other kind of way of, moving our of, of computing if not storing information so you know it's uh you know maybe they're there it's just uh, it's just like we're you know it's that kind of there do they've just kicked over an anthill and you know mm -hmm. we, we mean nothing to them and they mean nothing to us you, if i, I use the use the example at the beginning where if um, a species out there discovers voyager one floating through the galaxy if they're super intelligent bacteria but it's a snack but yeah. if they're if they're huge and ginormous, like they, they'll miss it because it's so small. So yeah. we we yeah. it's kind of put, we assume people are like, like yeah us. yeah we make you know and with some justification because any any life that's terrestrial you know that's on a terrestrial planet we can reasonably assume that the same tropes of intelligence, sociability, language we can reasonably assume that those will crop up again. They won't necessarily look anything like us. Their biology might be completely different. Mm. You know, it might be close to, more closely related to octopuses than they are to shrews, you know, but it's... Um, but they are likely to have limbs, weapons, eyes, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, and they'll have again. had a similar sort of journey to us. But, you know, then there's all kinds of other things that could possibly be out there. I mean, you know, I think it's... It's a really, I mean, it's a really, really, it's a fascinating problem to grapple with because the only way you can look for anything else is by assuming it's like you. Do you know what I mean? And then, but you're automatically then just completely reducing <laughs> your opportunities of finding anything. So it's, you know, there's a real uh, dilemma right at the heart of it, you know. Questions? One there. Hi, if you thought a little bit about, I mean, whether it's wise for us to be sending out signals? I mean, what do you think the expected value is that our first encounter will be positive for humanity as opposed to possibly catastrophic. Because Stephen Hawking is very negative, isn't he? Yeah, I, I'm not so. Um, <coughs> I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm, 
some, some days I think, oh God, what are we doing? Uh, <laughs> but then I think, well, you know, we have been broadcasting, it's a bit late now, I mean, we've been broadcasting, <laughs> <laughs> been broadcasting about 100 years, haven't we? Uh, getting on for, you know, I mean, in the 1930s, I suppose, it's a good 70, 80 years we've been going. So it's already, we're, already, uh, we're already 70 light years out in terms of uh, stuff that knows we're here. Um, so, uh, you know, what's the, <coughs> what's, how's this going to pan out? You know, are we expecting, I certainly would expect that within 70 light years of Earth, there would be other microbial life. Would I necessarily, you know, do any of us necessarily think that there would be intelligent life? That seems, <coughs> that seems unlikely. Intelligent life at some time within the last 14.7 billion years. Uh, interestingly, there's a kind of cutoff. I mean, as we look back in the galaxy, we look further back in time, it seems like less likely that life could have survived. You go back more than about 5 billion years and, and galaxies are so active... Um, you know, uh, in terms of, the, um, y you know, so energetic. There's so much electromagnetic, uh, hard, really hard electromagnetic radiation around. It's hard to see that how life could exist. So you're looking at a window of about, this is an interesting thing, we're looking at a, s a, s a light sphere of about 5 billion years around us where there could conceivably be intelligent life. Um, and interestingly, you know, our, our, our planet is around about that age. I find that interesting too. You know, I find it couldn't really be life much older than about five billion years. Still, you've got to figure there could be life out there with a half billion year start on us as of right now. And of course, communication. Once you once you start to get out further and further into the universe, it's that it's that travel time. So I just think it's so far away that it will be a great experience because we'll pick some. We'll pick up if we pick something up. We'll know it's a signal. We won't necessarily know for a long time what's in it. Um, there's no way, I mean, you know, unless, you know, Stephen Hawking's right and they can wormhole here and hoover up all our water and then, you know, <laughs> bugger off somewhere else. <laughs> seems a bit, un I mean, you know, maybe, maybe, but it seems to me they're not here because it's a really, really big place and there's a fundamental timing issue, you know, civilizations maybe don't last, and certainly technologies, if not civilizations, don't last long enough for civilizations to be visible to one another at exactly the right moment, you know. Anyway. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Do I, well, if the, use the mic. We talked a lot about uh, biological life. Yes. And, I mean, one of the sort of conclusions that I come to is uh, uh, if, if I wanted to, to travel to another solar system for example I wouldn't I wouldn't send a biological no. being I would send an intelligent artificial intelligence or something robot because all yeah. the scales fit so much better and you know biology is quite messy and we've got all these kind of we're not really adapted for for space travel um, do you think if you if we sort of stop talking about well you know creatures with arms and legs and, and eyes and and the idea of well any sufficiently advanced civilization out there would have actually gone through the biological phase and yeah. their progeny would actually be the machines they made. They may still exist in some form, but you know, do you think we're actually sort of looking in the wrong places for, for those kind of things as well? Would, would I, I guess that's sort of an open-ended question. But I completely agree with you, yeah. I mean, I, thi I think that um, it won't be, yeah, we wouldn't expect, I mean, certainly if if, ali if, if alien technology ever get m makes it here, I, 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 like you, I can't, can't see how it would possibly be biological. And we can see from, you know, what's the way that we're about. I mean, we don't send, we, we, do, we don't even send people out into s space anymore. We send robots. So, The head yeah. of SETI thinks that, because I was watching that video, I was it, I forgot his name. Martin Rees is very, very good on this. The, the astronomer, uh, the astronomer royal Martin Rees is very, very good on the robots robots thing and yeah he's absolutely yeah, that that would be it makes so much sense doesn't it i mean it's not uh, again we're constantly this is one of the things about the book we're constantly looking for our ourselves you know there's some deep primal need isn't there out there to find ourselves our own our own image but if we're really seriously going to look for alien artifacts then yeah i think we are genuinely looking in the wrong place you know there's a there's a fantastic i saw a brilliant uh, article by Paul Davis, you know, saying we should check the Lagrange points 
Um, yeah. Do you know what I mean? We should have a look. Is there anything there? Is there anything? You know, we're going to send. We're set, sending stuff out. You know, we're making use of those Lagrange points, aren't they? With some of our future spaceships. We should go and have a look. Is, is there anything there? Or the <laughs> centre of the galaxy, yeah. with, with a supermassive black hole that's just emitting, emanating energy. So that could be a place as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's there's a great, there's a really great Russian physicist as well, Kardashev, who talks about um, one of the things that you know, alien technology presumably couldn't conceal would be heat. Uh, because no matter how advanced your technology, you still got to comply with the second law of thermodynamics. You still, you know, um, you still have to give off heat. You still have to degrade energy. You still have to have an energy source and degrade it. So he had these sort of scales of civilizations. You know, he said like a type one civilization was was one that harnessed the energy of its home planet, a type two, its home star, a type three, its home galaxy. And this is another thing we should be doing. We should be looking. We should be looking for, for objects like that. Really large, large objects giving off a lot, uh, that are dark, apart from giving off a lot of heat. You know, that's, th those are other surveys, sky surveys that we should be doing. You know, I mean, it's. Is that where a, a species um, kind of surrounds a star? Yeah, in, in the classic uh, Freeman Dyson sort of w w it, it was sort of hand in hand with the work of Freeman Dyson, and Dyson came up with this idea of this thing called the, the Dyson sphere, which is basically yeah, exactly that. You, I mean, you basically surround. The idea is that the uh, home civilization uses up every ounce of sunlight coming from its home star, and eventually the star becomes dark because it's just completely surrounded with te with uh, technology. You know, so. Yeah. Hard to tell that apart from a dead star, you know, <laughs> um, which is also going to get off of a lot of heat and be very dark. But, it, but you know, what about, what about galactic-sized objects giving off, you know, objects the size of the galaxies giving off a lot of heat? You know, um, that would be a good place. That would be a good place to start looking. We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, yes, do you want to just shout loudly? Uh, yeah, um, uh, as you, you mentioned this floor and what language was there. Yeah. Um, You're exactly right. I mean, this is, this is the problem. As our technology gets more advanced, <laughs> it gets harder and harder to tell um, a really good signal apart from, apart from noise. You know, I suppose we've got to hope. Oh, I, I just, yeah. No, we just <laughs> hope that, they're, uh, that they know that. <laughs> that they're, they're not, um, you know, they use some rubbish, uh, they use some rubbish coding or something just to give us a break. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, do you know what? Do you know what would do? It would just be a simple lighthouse beam or something like that. Would do. Do you know what I mean? Just a, like an on and off. That's probably the easiest thing. And to use. That's what I hope. I think it's almost. You know. I think first you need. What I would do if I was sending out signals. Just first of all, let's just have a beacon. Let's just have say there's something here. So something that just maybe blips in prime numbers or just uses some kind of because you've got to be you've got to be able to tell it apart from pulsars, which are simple on and off. So uh, a normal, uh, just a regular lighthouse system won't do. So let's, let's do something with number and just send out some kind of beacon signal. And then if something contacts us, then let's worry about uh, opening a communication channel. And I, and I, can't, think, I can't think that really sending messages out is, the, is I, just that, you know, I just think if you just. Because wouldn't we want, we would just want to know someone else is out there. Yeah, So if exactly. we found that, that would be. That would be great, would wouldn't questions. it? That's, that would be all, all we'd need to know. It's also, it's extremely energy efficient. Um, you know, yeah, come to think of it, let's, let's do that. Uh, <laughs> we cracked it. <laughs> uh, the gentleman in the far left. Yeah. We have to sample. We have to sample, uh, you know, we, we'd have to sample surely hundreds of millions of of solar systems like our own before we'd sampled anything near enough to hope to encounter a signal. The great news is the whole process is speeding up so much that will happen in our lifetimes. Everyone here in this room will get to that point. We will, we will know pretty much whether there's intelligent life on the next, say, 
10 million, 100 million stars within our lifetimes. Thanks the to head of setting more, thanks things to is 2037. Think, yeah. yeah. Things we'll we'll get there. We, we will know. We'll have a pretty good answer to that question. But you're absolutely right. You, it's impossible to draw any conclusion at the moment from the tiny, tiny, tiny volume of, of, of space-time that we've sampled. I completely agree. Was it your book or somewhere I was reading, SETI would use the example of um, the amount that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial life, have sampled is a glass of water if the universe is the ocean. Wow. Of that sort yeah. of order Perfect. of magnitude. Perfect. I mean, we do know that we're not in a, you know, we're kind of in a conservation area, at <laughs> least. It's not that busy, you know, we're not in the middle of town, we know that, <laughs> but, you know, um, <laughs> but you've got to figure, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, yeah, in a hundred billion <laughs> stars, um, where there may be something like, I think, 11 billion Earth-like planets, yeah. Question here. Just a question related to the same subject. Yeah. Like, I mentioned this kind of uh, topic, looks like facts, what interesting comments and emails. Yeah, it's absolutely great. Can you share maybe a couple of interesting Have you had the UFO types coming? Yeah, I get the UFO. The, uh, sadly, unfortunately, it's, main, it's of two types. <coughs> One, people who think they've seen a UFO. <laughs> Secondly, people who think they've invented a time machine. <laughs> um, we have one at nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that one. I'll be arriving in a yeah. minute. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. I mean, I just don't know what to do with that because, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, time, time machines, doesn't that affect, isn't, that, isn't cause and effect quite important in life? I mean, <laughs> I, I have a problem with that. And, and, uh, and as to these sort of UFOs, I had a lot of fun um, researching UFOs in the book. That's a whole other story to get into, but it, it's really great. Um, if I could just give you one, f one fact that I learned, which is the guy who saw the first flying saucer in 1947 didn't see a flying saucer. He saw something that was the shape of, uh, he saw, saw something that was like, a, he said it was like a, a pie, a, a tin lid cut in half. It was a sort of semicircle that he saw, um, a kind of crescent shape, right? But it was misreported in the press, described as a flying saucer, and then afterwards there were many, many flying saucer sightings. There are a better example of the psychology of priming, I don't think you can find. But, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, I just... I love that but then there's no reason that they shouldn't be here. That's the point. That's the point, isn't it? There's no reason that they should... Why aren't they? That's an important question as well. It's not... You can't dismiss that on scientific grounds. You can dismiss it on nutter grounds, but <laughs> you can't dismiss it on scientific grounds, yeah. When, when uh, people used to report that they'd be met by aliens, the aliens always used to be inside our solar system. They used to be Venusians or Martians. And as yeah. our knowledge of the solar system got greater, these aliens happened to come from further and further away. <laughs> until now they come from <laughs> other galaxies and outside away. Yeah, 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 yeah. um, one final question, and we will wrap up. <coughs> yes. Oh, no, yes. Oh. Whoever, whoever Ben looked at. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Yeah. I think one of the things uh, about that is that, look, we were not intentional. The, the total amount of energy that we transmit yeah. is relatively small. Yeah, yeah. There is tremendous attenuation at that distance, so it's yeah. one by r squared. At some point, the strength of the signal is actually lower than the background, the uh, cosmic background radiation. Yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, to, to be able to produce a signal, you should be either, either you have to have a directional signal, in which case you again have the same problem that which direction do you aim at? Or you have to have a signal which is so powerful that you can still see it at any appreciable uh, cosmic distances. So given that power source problem, I think that one thing could be that maybe people who signal, like you know, other aliens who signal, they can only, uh, you cannot muster power source big enough, like you cannot manipulate yeah. the sun yet to use that as the signal far enough. So it could be that people just signal, but only to the neighborhood and that we don't see it actually. Yeah, I completely, uh, yes, that's a a absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And I think one of the hopes, really, of the next, we don't know where to, s we don't know where to point our telescopes to pick up a signal. We don't know where to point them to send one. And one of the things that uh, you're absolutely right, to, to get, you know, um, you know, bang for your buck, you've got to know where it is. You've got to know where you're sending the signal. Otherwise, you've just got to, you know, waste enormous amount of energy sending off a, you know, a, it's this billowing wave of electromagnetic <laughs> radiation. I'm just hoping it's going somewhere. And as you say, that's just the strength of that is just dropping off exponentially away from the Earth. Like 
yeah, make those, yeah, detectable, yeah, no, not detectable far enough away to, to be picked up by intelligent life. So what, one of the th exciting things... Leave us on a positive note. I will leave you on a positive note. We have this great, uh, uh, this great new telescope, the James Webb. It's an infrared telescope. We know from the Kepler Space Telescope, now we now know that Earth-like planets are common. So now what we do is we find, uh, we need to find the Earth-like planets in the vicinity of the Earth. And the first thing we need to do is image their atmospheres, use spectroscopy to figure out are, are the uh, gases in their atmospheres in chemical balance or not. Because if there's disequilibrium there, we can be fairly sure that there's some kind of life form powering that disequilibrium. And then we know where to point our telescopes. Chances of there being intelligent life, as we all know, thanks to the eukaryotic bottleneck, really, really small. But it will be a sensible place to start. And we can at least find life. And I'm thinking, I'm really hoping, within the next decade, we'll have the first results. No, nothing will be conclusive, but we'll have the first results saying, look, we looked at this Earth-like planet and this neighbouring solar system, and look, there's oxygen in its atmosphere. And it's out of chemical balance with the other, wi with the other gases. So we know there's something there. Do you know what I mean? Then we nuke them. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, please join me thanking Ben Miller. <laughs>